So enough about us. Welcome you to this program and Rishi Seema. It's Seema also. Seema is the strength we have, the wind beneath the Rishi's wings. So a wonderful job both of you and keep it up. Thank you for coming today. Thank you. Always uh, grateful for the support that Karishma and Deepa can also be able to provide to us. And uh, so let's let's get this going. Uh, we'll go a little past uh, 4:30 today. Will that be a problem for anyone? You know, do you have a hard stop at 4:30? Because you're starting a little bit late because of the parking. So, so Vinny, you know, I presume we can go. Uh, you can go a little beyond 4:30, and hopefully we don't have too many issues with that. And let's talk a little bit about Vinny. You know, I met Vinny almost two years back when we had a very first. Uh, college admission seminar here and Vinny was very engaging and he was really very enthusiastic and he has an amazing team that he always brings uh, to these seminars and that's how we have become friends over time. I, I, interesting story, I was talking to Vinny brainstorming over how we could basically make this event successful and one of the key concerns for Vinny was, you know, will we have people show up for this event? You know, I said, you leave that to me but here is what you can do. I invited him to our city council meeting. And Vinny showed up for three minutes and how many of you have seen the video of Vinny talking? Right, just a few. But that video got quite a few hits actually because Vinny was very engaging to the city council. He was there on TV on the, the Saturday channel and he was basically talking about what he's going to present to us today. And it seems like he's thought over it very well. It's a pretty compelling agenda as we run through the afternoon. So with that, I'm going to invite Vinny to come in and take charge. Let's give a big round of applause to Vinny. Everyone, how's everyone doing? Great. Okay. So, what brings you here on a Sunday afternoon rather than eating a siesta? How many are familiar with that European term siesta in the first place? Right? Because all this stuff sucks, right? <laughs> okay, you be here otherwise. Uh, all right. Okay. So, like Rishi said, we've got an awesome team here. We want to introduce them one by one. So, let's start with some hard numbers. Can you see the screen? Oh, the numbers are not there, right? For some reason, the numbers are not there. Okay, no worries. So, what this, what this screen is talking, this is compiled by the US News. Everyone familiar with US News as a major US paper? And what the, what the graph is showing is that over the last 10 years, the number of applicants to the US colleges have doubled. Now, for those of you, I would imagine that a bunch of technology types here and financial analysts, see that graph? It is not stable yet. It's still going up, right? Now, the second part, so maybe I can have help with slides. Now, the second one, which is a logical consequence of the first one, is that acceptance has gone down by 50%. Okay, now again, for those of you who are majored in statistics, especially parents and all of that stuff, including me, that graph is still pointing down. Okay, the worst is not over. It's just a fact of life. Why is it happening, guys? Anyone? So this is just demand and supply. The capacity remains the same, and the demand keeps going up. So over the last 10 years, something magical has happened, and we can talk over about this or a drink until the morning. As to why is this happening? So what is really happening is that in the last 10 years, somebody, somewhere in the country, people realize that college is important, right? The beauty of this country is a middle class that was actually built on $30 an hour jobs. With the internet disruption, those jobs are disappearing now. You can see that in fact in the recent election, right? This is, I'm not talking about politics or whatever. The fact is that the internet has disrupted our economy. And people are realizing that college is needed for a good quality of life. And that's what we're seeing, seeing there. So this year, when we saw the acceptances coming in for our students who come, come with us in our program, every single college has become harder to get into. It's been very disappointing for a lot of children. Exactly what that we talked about. So, Given that problem, the main thing that we want to talk to you today is this you cannot challenge. It is what it is, right? You can debate that, you can get angry about it, but it is what it is. 
right? What you can do is, and what we will share with you today is, think about this differently. Think about college admissions in a very different way. And the major point that we want to make to you is, why grades is this for you guys? That you need to work very hard for your grades and those kind of things, but don't stop there. If, so remember the topic for today is how do you get into a top ranked college? I'm not here to tell anyone that everyone should go to a UC or a Stanford. It's not my place. It's your life. It's your kid's life. But what I'm saying is, if you want to compete for a top tier college, and I'm defining those for today's conversation as the University of California or similar colleges in other states, right? University of Texas system or University of Michigan or University of Washington, University of Illinois, these top tier systems and all of these top tier private colleges. I am not including this conversation at California State University. Nothing wrong with them. Please don't get me wrong. Right? But for that conversation, UC, Stanford, Harvard, and all of these top tier colleges, you need to think differently. Okay. Are we together so far? Okay, everybody's just woken up? All right. Okay. I'll do a very quick introduction about UC Easy, and then we will jump right to our star of the day, Mr. Tim Wavy. So, UC Easy was founded by me and my co founder, Aitish Kolatu, right in the back. Aitish, raise your hand, please. No, no, no. So, both of us are two Latino parents, and both of us are first generation immigrants. Neither of us attended high school or college in the US. Okay, how many parents in this room relate to that? So, I have two kids. One of them graduated from UCLA three years back. Another one is in college right now in the University of Chicago. I'm a very proud dad. The process though was completely overwhelming. Especially because everything, high school stuff, uh, for those of you who did go to high school and college here, it's very hard for you to relate to what an immigrant goes through. So that's why we started this company, UC Easy. And our mission is, University and college admission made easy for all families. Now our mission is primarily to help first generation immigrant families. The definition being the parents are the first one in their families to be in the US. Having said that, everyone is welcome. It's just that the mission is to help those families, be Latino, be Indian American, Chinese American, doesn't matter. Okay. Now we are a social business. What that means is we talk about the business element a little later today, but we are here to help everyone. High income, low income, doesn't matter. So we have a bunch of free software applications to help people. Above all, we have an initiative called UC Easy Philanthropy, through which we offer free college guidance to 50 students, low income students every year. And we want to increase that number through partnerships. And at some point, any of you that are fortunate that are blessed financially and you want to contribute to all this, please contact us, either with money or time mentoring. We, have, we currently have 25 counselors, also defined as college admission experts, and you will meet four of them today. One of them, Rachel Mack, will be presenting in a few minutes. Last point I wanted to make is that we have received, because of our focus and new way of doing things, we have received a lot of media coverage from USA Today which happens to be the newspaper with the largest circulation in the country, our own Mercury News, and several other papers. So, sounds like we are on the right track in terms of doing all the things. What are you going to do today? The biggest thing which I talked about earlier, let me just repeat, is how do you think differently if your goal is to compete for those top tier colleges? That's a big thing that you'll learn. The second thing you'll learn is, for those of you who say, hey, I cannot do self-help. I'm not getting enough help from my school. How can I get help from UC Easy? We'll talk about that. OK, lastly, the last slide here, the agenda. So we're going to start with Mr. Tim Ravy. Hey, Tim. Say, say hi. OK, so there is. No one can do justice to an introduction for him, so I let him introduce himself. We just call him Papa Bear. <laughs> yeah, at work I have him call me Grandpa Tim. <laughs> can you guys all hear me in the back? Yeah. Yeah, usually you can. Until I used to be an instructor, because I yell at you. 
I work at a school uh, here in California, Berkeley, I'm an admissions officer. We're very busy this time of year. But I have information for you, if this works better, I have information for you specifically tailored to what you're interested in hearing about. Uh, and Benny, you had some general questions that you had prepared already, or did you want to do it a different way? Uh, except before we get to that, so I just want to finish the rest of the agenda. So we'll do a Q&A where I will be doing a CNN type thing with Tim. Uh, and then after that, what we're going to do is we're going to bring Rachel, one of our counselors. We'll introduce herself in a second. And she is going to, so he's going to talk about what goes on in the mind of an admissions officer, right? So as you can see, admissions officer doesn't have two horns on their head. Friendly guy, right? So for the, for the kids in this room, these guys are good guys. So hopefully you get that. Now, after you learn from him as to what goes on this side of the desk, we're going to bring Rachel. And she'll say, OK, now that you've heard him, now let me share with you what you need to do to get to him. Making sense? And then after that, what we're going to do is we're going to split you up in two different groups. So we're going to bring Grandpa Tim back for your questions, all free flowing. We're going to pass around three by five cards, write your questions, and have at it. In parallel, what we're going to do is that we're going to have four of our counselors, like Rachel, David Campos, and a couple others uh, that should be here. Did, did all of you or some of you at least sign for the one-on-one -on -one session while signing in? So you guys would have gotten your little slip of paper with A, B, C, D, those stations. So we will guide you to those counselors for one-on-one -on -one sessions. So that will be the parallel event. Kim Remy back and one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> all right, so with that, did you want to do a little bit more introduction or should you be no, I think I represent uh, what most admissions officers do. Uh, we work for all of you, but we satisfy the people who run the school. In the case of Berkeley, that's the faculty. So when we look at an application, we're doing our best to get everybody in, but we're trying to match them up, not judge them. We're trying to match them up with what the faculty said, bring this type of person to the next class. That's how it works. So maybe in some of the words I share with you, you can get a feel for if you're a good fit there or not. That's something you really want to do. We are a big school, so there's room for a lot of us. So we're going to share this microphone. And uh, so essentially what we have is a series of questions. Hopefully we'll get here just a little bit from you. All right, okay. So the first question is, oh, by the way, just for a show of hands, how many kids here are either are juniors or or parents? Okay. Current 12th graders who just finished the process. I'm glad you're not here. <laughs> yeah, okay. So how many 10th graders? All right, okay. So, the first question for Tim is, we all think of UCs or these campuses like Berkeley and LA as like one big campus. It's like, hey, Berkeley is like one big thing. There is a concept of colleges inside Berkeley and UCLA with my doctor then. Do you want to just share with the audience what that means? So to, to operate, uh, a university means you have more than one college on your site. So, University of California, Berkeley, we have 14. We have six for undergrads. Uh, and they're generally just arranged by function. And it'll also evolve. And I graduated in 1973, yeah, I'm that old. But in 1974, on campus, our School of Agriculture was changed to become the College of Natural Resources. And that's what it's known today. So why would you do that? Uh, things change. When I went to school, we used typewriters. So as the world changes and the needs of the, of the world to get educated, the schools will evolve and change into different things. In fact, UCLA, uh, in the beginning UCLA was the, the, southern, the southern campus for the normal school, which is San Jose State, before World War I. But the population increased, and so they sold it to the UCs, and UC called it University of California South, and then LA, and then half LA. So as we've added other campuses and you've added other colleges. My hearing aids are picking this up just fine. But I can talk 
talk a little louder. But the main thing is that a school is simply an evolving uh, vehicle to give you the education that you need today. And so the name will sometimes change. Or when you're shopping, you want to look at a university uh, and notice how they arrange themselves. Why? So when you apply to a UC, you're actually going to apply to the college on the campus. So for Berkeley, it should be letters in science, engineering, chemistry, environmental design, college and natural resources, or letters in science. And that puts a little wrinkle in it, but the sooner you get comfortable with how things are arranged, you realize that what you're doing is you're applying to work at a certain college on a campus. And one other person 
will also read that application beside me. So that's just an indication of these things here. We take into account your personal, your individual context. Oh, I go to Monta Vista. Well, my parents are the most jacked up people in the world when I go to Monta Vista. So I have to take that into account. Maybe you guys don't have a lot of financial resources. Maybe you're suffering a lot. You've got bad things happening. We're going to take that into account to answer this one question. What did you have to work with? And it's going to vary. And secondly, what did you do with that opportunity? So it's not the pile of metals that I'm looking at. It's what did you do to get even one? And when I say you, I'm not talking about your parents with internships or driving you all over town in the Odyssey. Yeah, I spoil my grandkids too. It doesn't help. So you want to take them from that dependency to the where they're out doing this stuff themselves. Because if you get to a big four-year school like the UC, guess what? The people who get the most out of it are the ones that, <coughs> what's in that door? How do I get in there? Now, the school's not full of everybody like that. But that is a very strong characteristic. So if you understand me, you don't have to hit every button. But the more you do, the happier faculty is with the selections we make for them, and you're likely to get an offer to come. Does that make sense? In general, that's it. So, if I try to summarize all the different things that Tim added on his list, you go to the UC side, there are like 14 things that they talk about when they look for admission decisions. That's an overwhelming list, right? The main message, though, is and I like the way you mentioned in a previous seminar that most of us, when we think about colleges, right, we look for GPA and then beyond that we look for test scores, SAT or ACT. Majority of us stop there, right? Now, an analogy which Tim gives or gave, which I really enjoyed, is that all of this stuff, your coursework, GPA, test scores, they tell him what's here here, right? But how does he know what's here? Well, you're an analogy, right? So, you want to that? Well, you don't have to be super at everything. But, if you have balance, you're going to be in our organization for a long time. The more help that you bring to others, the more that you can do yourself, the easier. We're a big public. We don't have the resources to hold 36,000 hands. Of hand. So when you have character, then I know that you're going to help us with the rest of the students while you're there, to a certain extent. So when we talk about doing things for others in leadership, it's not about being on present something, maybe, but maybe I'm just really helpful. And that's what is valued in our big group, among all these other things. You understand? I can use any of these things that you tell me about in your application to lift you up. But that's not the final selection stage. So just so you know, I can't tell you how to get in. I can tell you how we value your application, if that makes sense. Because there's too many variables about the ultimate selection. But if you want a good chance at a school, they will tell you this is what we value at this school. And then an admissions officer will never judge you but they will match you to a good opportunity. So when you apply, you get four options, four offers back. Every single one of those is a good deal for you. You get to pick which one. And that's why so many applicants have to get offered, because you can't go to more than one school, right? So if you used to do four applications and I do 10, we got a lot more applications to read but there's not necessarily that many more applicants. So relax about this admissions process. It is a buyer's market, just so you know. It doesn't feel like it, but it is. So on that one, Tim, possibly that what would help on that buyer's market thing. So how, 
our audience here understand your notion about the yield rate, especially at Berkeley, and what it means for them. Which rate? The, the yield rate. So if I'm at a UC uh, that's not as in as much demand, I may have to offer 10,000 students to end up with 1,000, right? Because they're going to get offers all over the place. Some will come. A top school like a Berkeley is 45%, not a hundred. So we offer 12,000 to end up with about six. Yeah, think about it. Why? Because you can only go to one school. And when Berkeley is selecting applicants, a lot of those applicants are delightfully wanted everywhere. You can only go to one school. So just as a way to explain to you, this admissions game is a two-way street. When you get an offer, it means you're doing that school a favor if you come. But we know you can only come to one. So I don't want you to feel like there's judgment here. If one school evaluates you and offers you a, a selection and another one doesn't, it's not a judgment. Whatever you said in that application, you kind of fit with what all the things that faculty wants, or maybe you were a little bit off. Could you succeed at Berkeley? Oh yeah. That isn't the issue. The issue is who has the most of what we are looking for in this class? And it's not a judgment that you couldn't do well. Make sense? Okay. So let us move on to, I see a lot of kids in the crowd, and uh, just my own kids' journey, they were petrified of this process, right? And uh, to that thing about the devil with two holes, are you guys horrible? I personally am. <laughs> horrible. But, uh, but the process is, um, well, it's like this. Uh, I went on my last first date in 1967. I still remember how nervous I was. Yeah, it was the poor same lady. <laughs> but when you go on a first date, you have all this uh, drama, tension. Am I going to be accepted? Am I going to, is it going to work? And that's what, it, unfortunately, a lot of this admissions process feels like. And of course, if you talk to your friends, they have a lot of really helpful advice. You know, put on a lot of high karate aftershave. That'll work. <laughs> it's a joke, but. So you'll get a lot of free advice through social media, and just like that, most of it's not true. Let's cut back to the core of things. How do you win in the college admissions game? Simple. You get into a college, any college, that has what you're looking for and allows you to move forward professionally and academically. So when I say it's a buyer's market, because you're sitting here, you're probably within 400 miles of 40 or 50 schools that can do that. But they don't have a name like Berkeley, so they go, oh, they must not. They're fine. If you bring, who thinks there's magic on the Berkeley campus? I do. How does it get there? That's right, you bring it in your pockets. It's you, not me, it's you. And if you go to another school, if you go to San Francisco State, or San Diego, or some other school, that's where the magic is. So don't think that we are changing you. The schools don't. Every school will give you an opportunity for you to grow. So family, parents, relax about that. Sure, apply for a Berkeley. If you can get in there, that's not a bad place to do it. But you don't need to go there to be successful. You need to understand. We have three kids. One went to Berkeley. He's got the least education. It's true. He's got a bachelor's degree. But one of the most education went to De Anza, San Francisco State, first master, second at USF, working on his doctorate in education. Is it the school? I don't think so. But it, it, that's the point. You want to, you want to relax about it. If, if, this, if my speech to you means anything, it's that you, you're going to win. You cannot lose. 
But don't fixate on a school as saying, oh, this will cure me. This will save me. This will turn me into hip hop kid. <laughs> I went to Berkeley. But uh, I have a little magic, even at 20 years old. And I think that's the main thing to understand here is when you're approaching this, relax. Do the work, get advice, and understand that, as they say here, and Berkeley believes, UC system believes in the same thing. Go to some place that will help you move forward. And if that's West Valley, so be it. I'm a transfer from Palo Alto Media. I was, still, I was admitted to UCLA and Davis, not Berkeley. I grew up in Alameda, we were too poor. I couldn't even go to Davis. I did three years at community college. I was working. Did my last two years at Berkeley. I'm first gen. I had no idea. But our children know. They're all, all like college or postgrad. And that's the difference that advice like this can make for you. Demystify. I hope that's helpful. All right. So now I'm going to switch to a few other things. So bunch of first generation, okay, show of hands one more time, of how many parents here are first generation immigrants? Okay, very large number. The reason I raise that is, especially from India where I came from, or from China, or from other countries, when we thought of colleges, we really thought about what we wanted to study. Right? It, it was, especially in the Indian context, if you guys are related, it's like he either became an engineer, doctor, or you were a? Or a? Loser. <laughs> I'm not saying that I felt that way, but that's where the society made us feel, right? So, I'm here with Mr. Ravi's help to challenge that notion for you guys. That when you, especially when you advise your children, and when the kids in this room really think about majors, please keep an open mind. And so let me ask Mr. Ravi, so Tim, share your perspective with them about majors, how, how important are majors to college applications, how much intensity or focus should be given, and uh, do colleges allow majors to be changed once you So several questions, but the first one is, does it matter? Sometimes it does. You go to a small college on our campus, like chemistry, they say, tell us one of these three majors that we have, tell me where you want to start. College of Engineering. Which of these 14 majors do you want to start in? I want to know that. But when I get there, I find, well, if in the first semester or first year, I'd like to go switch over to one of the other majors, they're going to tell me, that's fine, because you've all been working on material that supports every one of those majors. Now, if I'm a fourth year student, I might be there a little longer because I might have to take subjects that take two years to complete. So it, from an admission standpoint, usually not. But some, it, it can make a difference to you if that's what you know you want to do. You're very well prepared. You've done a lot of work in that particular area. You just want to go, go, go. But our experience is that the vast majority of students who think they know what their major is will change it when they get there. Because they find something that's a little better fit. So the answer is yes, sometimes. But normally, for almost all of our applicants at Berkeley, it doesn't matter. Our biggest college, Letters and Science, is meant for the college, not the major. It's not grad school. So if I get into letters and science, I can get a degree in physics or, or mathematics or computer science or Celtic study or rhetoric. I just need to decide after I get there. Your college counselors will ask you when you come in, what are your top three things that you want to do? Knowing that over half of them will find something that's a little different and it's a better fit. So that's how it works. And that's true in, in America. So yes, there are some niche uh, areas where it's helpful to know going in, but usually not. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a little, uh, so we have a few giveaways. Uh, so I think the major is my favorite thing. Uh, 
especially based upon my daughter, of course, the story that some of you in the back may have already heard because I love telling it, and she hates me sharing this. It's like, that. my life is not public. So, um, Rishi, we have some giveaways here, right? Yes, right. All right, so, you see LA. Which is better, you see LA or Oh, this one is way better. Yeah, you're going there. Okay. No, at work, we call UCLA the baby bear. Because <laughs> they weren't around for the first few years at Berkeley. But, but from a, a consumption standpoint, you, you're not going to know that they're, they're world class. Every UC, when they have what you're looking for, is world class. Some are not as big, but that's how it is. So that, that's a standing joke between me and them because my daughter is a Bruin and so am I at UCLA. Okay. So, all right, so UCLA, when I went there for the parent orientation, and there was a dean, dignified, elegant gentleman like Mr. Ramey, and he talked to us, and I still remember this, so he said, so this is what matrix, right, so, uh, so he said that what percentage of UCLA graduates or undergrads actually change majors at least once in four years? So if you answer this question correctly, you'll get a free gift. We have an, we have an answer over here. Okay, no? 50%. 50%, all right, okay. Uh, we, we have a... What did you say? Did you just look up, did you just Google that answer? <laughs> <laughs> no, she asked one of our favorites. You can see the Oh my gosh. This, this, this gets us more. So the answer, guys, is 85%. So just take a moment. Take a moment to let that number sink in. How much hard time do we give ourselves and parents, and how much hard time do we give our kids? Starting from 10th grade, is that, you need to know from 10th grade that what you want to study. I have two questions for that. First, did you? Uh, at our age, I have no idea until I was 50 what I wanted to do, guys. <laughs> so, obviously, jokes aside, but the, the second thing is 85%. All right, so for you, Mr. Ricky, would you draw a little slip of paper because that we heard this. At the end of the show, you can meet Ruchi at the back in the red uh, shirt, and she'll give you her. So just draw them. <laughs> okay, you want to read that? Or? I will. This is a UCEC t-shirt. All right. Congratulations. I think there's a Mercedes in here, too. <laughs> Okay, so since we're on a roll, thank you, Mr. Ravi. Since you're on a roll, part two of this question. Now, this one is tricky. What percentage of kids at UCLA change majors at least twice in four years? What's your answer, man? Hold that answer. Okay, 51. Okay, 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. So he is kind of right, but I think 45 is the answer, something like that. So this gentleman gets that. Okay, so Mr. Rick, another draw. Whoa. <laughs> what is it that you need? <laughs> well, it turns out, here's what you're going to get. No way! A free 15 minute video consultation <laughs> with a UC Easy Counselor. <laughs> counselor. <laughs> Okay, so, so that one was a free consultation with one of our UC Easy Council for 15 minutes. So let these numbers sink in, guys. 85% change at least once, 40% or whatever that number is, something like that, changed twice. Take that thing home. Think about that, right? Now, uh, personal stuff, right? So how many times did my daughter change majors in those four years? Okay, so this is a trick question, like, because she's a corner case. How many? Did you say two? Three. Oh, she said three, and three is the correct answer. <laughs> right? So, the story of this is, and I'm going to keep it very short because he's a star today, not me. The story with her is uh, that she wanted to, when she went in, she wanted to be a doctor. And so I asked her, and I'm kind of a hands off there, but I asked her, so, you know, why do you really want to do this? And she looks at me and says, duh. What's the duh So, So, I have my wife's brother, he's a distinctly rich doctor, and he flaunts that money. So it's like, God, Dad, I want to be like him. He's got so much money. So <laughs> two months into it, so she went into the dual major of psychology and biology. That's the 
pre-match, I put up that. And two months later, it's like, damn, mom, I decided to drop biology. What happened with that? I went to Monte Vista, Monte Vista, it's just too many crazies about science. I don't think I was ever a science person. So now she left it, psychology. And she's a smart girl, so she talked to several other, hey, uh, she talked to several other people and came back and said, psychology is a soft major. Hard to find a job after that. I, and I don't want to study after UCLA. So she dropped that and went back. Right? And now I'm like, what do you want to do? I don't know, Dad. Let me talk to people. Yeah, just leave it to me. A few, few months later, she comes in and says, I want to study economics. Why? Wow, don't ask me. And as it turned out, and then she said, I want to go to London School of Economics for a summer program. Of course. So, obviously, and she went there, she just wanted to go to Europe. <laughs> So, and then after that, economics is too many numbers. Dad, you are like a statistics guy, you enjoy this, but I'm not into numbers. So, what are you going to do next? I have no idea. Six months later, the entire story, the way it ends, is that she said, I want to study communications, as in marketing, public relations, and that required an intra change within UCLA. And she did that. So, to his point, college of ethics and science, with all of these majors, biology, psychology, economics, communications, they were all in the same college. But that did require a change. Credit to her, she worked hard, got a GPA up, and then after that, that's a Cinderella story, guys. She graduated in communications, really happy. She's been working for the last three years. But there's a big moral of the story, right? So uh, without sight of lead you to think about this real story, I've actually asked her to record the story because every time I tell this, she says, that is not accurate. So, uh, but you get the point, right? So now, having said that, I do want to make one point, which can be too, uh, in different ways, that as a parent, you think about that about 15% of kids know very early what they want to do, right? Now that's where parenting comes in. That those kids, you need to recognize that and support that. I want to be the next filmmaker. I want to be the next even people, for example, right? Recognize those things. But 85% or so science indicates, or research in this case, that people will change. All right? So with that, what has to do? Well, we have, we have one of our three who's was, was as big as what he wanted to do. He retires next month as a lieutenant colonel. He wanted to fly Hornets off aircraft carriers. So he used Berkeley, which has an NROTC unit, to get into the Marine Corps right out of college. And that's what he did, he was a carrier pilot. Worst job for parents ever. But that's what he wanted to do. Uh, so sometimes I do is beat him, and sometimes I do is stand back and watch him swirl around. But they're going to get somewhere if they're finishing up that bachelor's degree somewhere. I have a friend who's retired now as a doctor, major. Guess what the major was? English. <laughs> also very good on the MCAT, but that was the major. Uh, so you want to. If you're coming to America, it's different here. Uh, you can go straight through, or you can use the first two years to discover something that you want to focus on. They're only a major, they're not a total. So your undergraduate experience, even in engineering, you're going to have electives outside of your main. So be coming. All right, so we covered something really important, guys, of majors, right? Remember, we talked about how most of us talk about, when we think about college admissions, we think about grades, obviously, a good thing, right? We talk about test scores, a good thing, then we talk about majors. Now, let's move on to a few other things. So, extracurriculars. Help us understand as to why they are important and how important they are. Your extracurriculars help you in a couple of ways. One, they give you an opportunity to talk about for you personally, why this is a thing for you. <laughs> Secondly, when you get good at it, you're in a position to nurture other people, help them learn how to do it. But regardless of what it is, it could be a study of earthworms, colleges aren't concerned about what it is, but they're concerned about the quality you pull out of it. So if you have a choice between doing 10 things like here, or three or four up here, guess which one helps you with admissions? Yeah, this one up here. Quality is always more important than quantity. And the depth of your personal desire is what any smart college is trying to match you with. 
We're not trying to say, oh, we're going to turn you into this here. What we're saying is, oh, you like that? We got that. So come to our school and get better at it. Remember, you're the buyer. So you want to go to a place that has not just uh, the technical knowledge, but also has the, I could say, the love for what it is that you want to do the way you want to do it. It should match with who you are. You're going to be there for four years with other people just like that. You don't want to be the one that doesn't fit. Does that make sense? So on, on all of these topics, when Tim comes back later, you can ask him more detailed questions. I'm just providing an overview at this time. So let's, let's get to the last one for this session. Very important. A lot of people, especially juniors, right? Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, people think differently about, hey, are college essays important? Right? Especially when it comes to UCs, that are like half year, half year, it's like a polarized country, right? Half Democrats, half Republicans. And some say essays don't matter, and some say they do. Very so you see. Sometimes they don't. I mean, you may already have enough in the application where I'm going, this is a great fit. But normally, by the time I get to that stage in the application, you're in the mix with a lot of other people, right? So when I evaluate you, when you're able to have a strong personal insight to the question or response, it helps me understand, yeah, this is your what the faculty is looking for. And it's not a type of person, it's just that you might be bubbly. You might be like a Vinny, you know, it's like, you're just going to take it and go, go, go. You might be very quiet, but very deep. You're going to have value in there because you're going to tell me about it. You're going to tell me about you. Not what you think Berkeley's looking for. You're going to tell me about you. So when you're answering those responses like that, you just want to tell us who you are and what you would like to have. So then the college can match you to the opportunity. That's what they're really trying to do. So yes, sometimes that personal insight question is pivotal. Sometimes it cements the evaluation, and sometimes it's more than you need, but you don't know that. So use this as an opportunity on one hand to tell the colleges, but the spin-off for you is you may never ask yourself about these characteristics of yourself, these qualities of yourself. And when you write them down and you take them to somebody who knows you and they go, yeah, that's you. That's the best description of you I've ever heard, I've ever seen. You can take that with you wherever you go. So, you can use it as a tool to all the students for their Actually, can we go on to your question? Unless it's something really short, because we're trying to rush the time. Go ahead. Um, I was thinking about extracurriculars. Thinking of extracurriculars, um, there are some things that a lot of people do. And um, since you were um, mentioning um, that distinguishes the person how someone does something. For example, playing soccer, playing the piano. Um, what would catch your um, attention with, with, with... Okay. So uh, what the lady here was asking, so we'll have Rachel back, the next speaker, address your question. Okay, so essentially your question was about extracurriculars, about what should you do, and how do you choose between different things. Okay, we'll have you repeat your question when she comes back. All right, so on this, uh, on this uh, essay topic with Tim, is there anything else? I do want you to tell them that story about, uh, or maybe let's do it at the end, about as an admissions officer, what is a good essay? How do you know that? And just tell, tell us that story about your wife giving you feedback in the morning about it, that she heard you solving the night before. Oh, well, uh, not always, but um, you know, sometimes when you get to do this work, you get to see how great these children are that you're raising. You know, the same ones that make you mad because they don't do it. Uh, but in our perspective, I, what I see is that this planet is fine. It's fine. And what I'll see in 
the responses from some of these people is, I see these young little trees that are going to be giant oaks because they have character. Some of them have even been tested brutally. But even if you're from around here and you haven't been, you see that character, that concern for others, that clarity of thinking, and just kindness, or purpose, very purposeful. Those are things that you're going to, you don't want one type of person in your group. You want a mix of all of these things. So the answer to answer your question is when I see things in there, and I see a 17-year-old that has the wisdom of an ancient, I'm perplexed and amazed at the same time, but I am thrilled to have that person in the mix. And honestly, Admissions officers, the numbers don't matter that much when you get somebody like that. That person is the one who's going to get selected by almost every school because personally, they're awesome. In the context of music. When I said I've done tens of thousands of these, you know when you see them. But they have to tell me. They have to have enough self-awareness to be able to describe it. And they have to have the confidence to be able to let it go and not use words like, you know, um, use, use big words. Just use real language. Uh, so then I, then I understand it's a genuine person. Remember I said it a while back. When you're eligible for college, you could graduate from it. When we're selecting, it's not because you're going to be the first in your class. We'll have some that will be like that but you're going to be a mix. And so for extracurriculars, you see, it doesn't matter, but to kind of get back to the answer to that question, why is this important to you? Not only does, is this what it does for me, but this is what it does for people around me. People who have left. Think about that. So when you see that in the group, you're going to stand up. How do you stand out? Be yourself and give us a chance to evaluate you and your greatness. But put it all in there. It's not all academics. Remember, if you're just a little bit better, students out of uh, Stanford or Berkeley are going to pull high numbers in an aggregate. But you're going to have people in there too whose numbers are just average. But that's not the only thing you do in college or in life. So, it's just like people want to get rich. They go to business administration. You can't. Or you can do theater arts, like the billionaire named <coughs> Oprah. You drop her anywhere, she's going to run things. You see what I mean? So when you think about a major or at, at the bachelor's degree level, yes, sometimes it can be very encompassing, but sometimes it's just a way to get through it. The person that's behind that major in that transcript, coming to that college is the person that we look for, if that makes sense to you. This is not a decathlon. I was a competitive athlete, I know all about that. If you have charisma, if you have kindness, you're going to jump out. If you don't have it, don't fake it. It's okay. I mean, still get you there. Does that make sense? Another trick question? Not right now. Not right now. Okay, so that was the end of round one with Mr. Ravi. So what we're going to do now? So first of all, the kids in this room, I hope you guys are paying attention to the big messages that we're going to give. Is think beyond just grades and SAT scores, right? That's the big message we're trying to give. So Tim Ravi is going to come back uh, in just a little while. We want to distribute three by five cards for you to write down your questions. And I think you try to address as many as you can. Now, what we're going to do is that now that we learn about what the bad guys think, and as we learn, these are not really bad guys, right? You see that? No, right? So they, they want you, right? What did he say? Without him, Berkeley is just buildings. Without you guys, right? You make Berkeley what it is, right? So they want you as much as you want them. So, so people. Now what we're going to do is to bring a UC EV counselor or a coach or a guide. These are the kind of people that if you need more help, you can actually work with.
talk to us after the seminar for that. Now, the goal of this next 20 minutes or so with Rachel Mann. <coughs> she is a trained college admissions expert. Tim Reedy is sitting on the other side of it, right? So you learn about that part. Now with Rachel, what she's going to say is, now let me help you act on these things so that you can start thinking about what to do about it. Does that make sense? So with that, Rachel, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So while he's pulling out uh, my presentation, uh, let me introduce myself a little bit. I'll give you a little background. Um, so I am a, I'm a high school counselor, as well as um, a UC Easy admissions counselor. And um, I've been working with students for a really long time, um, since uh, I guess it's been almost 20 years now. And uh, I myself attended uh, Stanford University as an undergraduate. And um, I have to say that my parents, they weren't really part of the process when I was applying to college. They were first generation themselves. Um, college for them, all they had to do was take a test. They took a single test and they were in or out and that was it. Um, and so I kind of had to figure a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of stuff out on my own. Um, and I was very fortunate um, to be able to attend Stanford, but I'm really appreciative just of all the parents here that you're here to support your students in the process. A lot of you are starting early, um, and I think that's wonderful that, that you guys are, are just learning more so that you can also support your parents, uh, your students. Um, I also got my, uh, I have a master's degree in counseling, and um, Um, I have a master's degree in counseling, and, um, and I currently work at a high school uh, on the peninsula. So I'm going to start with kind of a little quiz for you guys. Okay, so um, these are different aspects of college admissions, um, of, a, of a student's application. Um, and the National Association of College Admissions Counselors, actually, Um, so, out of things like grades, SAT scores, um, strength of curriculum, this is not in order. But what do you think most colleges consider most important when it comes to college admissions? What do you guys think are, say, the top three factors? Anyone want to guess, like, what, what do you think is most important? Maybe essay? Maybe, maybe grades? Letters of recommendation? Leadership? Which would personality maybe? Okay. Yeah, so those are great guesses. So in a national survey um, of all American colleges, um, the number one what turned out to be grades. Um, hold on just a second. Okay, here we go. So in a composite survey, grades um, tend to be you know the top. Uh, admissions factor, which makes sense. After all, this is, we're talking about an academic institution. So grades are typically uh, come first. Strength of curriculum um, is typically second. So strength of cur cur curriculum is basically um, when they're looking at the classes that you take, how rigorous are they? Are you taking advantage of all the academic opportunities made available um, at your schools? Are you taking those AP classes, those honors classes? Um, the third most important factor that they look at is uh, test scores, okay? SAT, ACT, uh, those tests uh, that are required for admission for most colleges, okay? So the first three are all mostly focused on your numbers, right? But as you go down, um, they're looking at other things beyond just academics. So um, fourth would be application essay, and then fifth, and this is especially for private colleges, teacher and counselor recommendations. Then sixth is demonstrated interest. Have you guys heard of demonstrated interest? Are you familiar with that? Um, demonstrated interest is basically how much interest a student shows in wanting to go to that particular college. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then class rank is, tends to be seventh, and then extracurriculars. Okay. Now this is across all, you know, there's 2,200 colleges. Obviously, depending on the college, individual colleges are going to emphasize different things. Okay. So here's the good news. You're more than just your numbers. For a lot of students, 
especially maybe you know students who don't feel very confident about their grades, you're more than just your numbers. So, um, and Tim also mentioned this, that even if um, maybe you mess up in a couple of classes, or maybe your test scores aren't as strong as they wish they are, um, they're looking at other factors as well. They're looking also at who you are as a student, who you are as a person, okay? So you are more than just your numbers. Next slide. I'm gonna talk about a few of these things. Um, we're all aware that yes, it is important to get good grades, it is important to do well on the SAT and ACT, but let's talk about some of those other factors beyond just test scores. Um, and I'm going to go kind of in backwards order, so I'm going to start with talking about extracurricular activities. And I want to address the question that this parent had earlier. Um, next slide. So a lot of parents will ask, and students will ask, what type of extracurricular activity should I focus on? Is there a certain extracurricular that will be um, you know, basically make my application look stronger. And, um, and what I like to tell families is which extracurricular you pursue is really less important um, than how much passion and persistence you demonstrate. So is this something that the student really loves to do? Is it something um, that is really important to you? And is it something that you've persisted with? Um, or was it something that you just tried out maybe junior year? Um, and they quit the following year, okay? Um, but they're looking really for passion and persistence. Um, in terms of how you can use your extracurriculars to strengthen your application, um, first of all, I would emphasize depth over breadth, and this was mentioned earlier, right? So instead of joining seven different clubs and just be participating on a kind of a shallow level and all those, it's better to choose a handful of things that you're really passionate about, that you're really interested in, okay? So definitely depth over breadth. Leadership, initiative, if you can have a leadership role um, in that, and it doesn't even have to be like you're president of the club, but within that club or that activity, are you taking initiative? Are you coming up with ideas? Are you going above and beyond? You know, are you on the robotics team, you know, just like as a member, or are you actually like planning um, for your competition? Are you taking on that, that leadership role? And then finally, um, if you can find some sort of alignment to your potential major or career, sometimes that can also help um, because that demonstrates some interest in that career or that field, right? Um, for example, I sit on a scholarship committee um, and um, this week we had a meeting and we were giving out a nursing scholarship and we had two students, one student that we were picking between. Uh, one student, she had stronger grades but her extracurriculars, you know, she wasn't really involved in a lot. Another student, her grades were lower, but she volunteered at the hospital. She said she wanted to be a pediatric nurse, so she's been working with children. She has a job working with children um, as well. She babysits, she took our child development class. So you could tell that, you know, nursing was something that she was really passionate about, and it shined through, through in her extracurriculars as well. So. Um, and I would say, you know, you want to do this not even just as a strategy to get into college, as you're thinking about extracurriculars, but if you flip to the next slide. The question is not even just like what's going to look good, but what do you really love to do, you know? Um, what do you really love to do? High school is a great time for, for those of you who are students, it's a time for you guys to be exploring about what are your interests, you know, what are your passions? You know, um, and the more you enjoy something, the more you genuinely love to do something, um, the better you're going to get at it, right? Uh, the farther you're going to go, the more likely you're going to naturally take on maybe a leadership role because you're excited about it. One example is uh, like music, for example. There's a picture of a student playing violin up there. So I worked with a student um, who loves violin. He, he's been playing since he was little, and he really has a passion for it. And he loves it so much that um, he actually started, uh, he put together a little quartet with some of his friends, and they started playing at local senior homes and at local events, um, just to share the love of music with other people. And it became big enough. It was like, you know, it was like he had, he had started his own nonprofit. Um, and, um, and he was so passionate about it, he loved it so much that, you know, that really shined through, I think, on his application. And he's going to be attending Yale this fall. Um, 
On the other hand, there are students who, whose parents force them to take, you know, maybe piano or violin. I have to confess, I did that myself. I have two kids. I forced them to play piano for years. Um, but, you know, if they're really not that into it, if it's something that, you know, you're not very passionate about, you're not going to necessarily go that extra mile, right? Um, you're not going to go as far with it. So really do pursue, pursue things that you love. So, uh, for the audience, one question on the So, are there any eighth graders in the audience? Or, okay, there are seven. Seven? Right. Yeah, what stage should a parent, obviously seven and eighth graders are in part, for kids to think that they are, at what stage or what grade should a parent start thinking about doing extra credit for the Right, so sort of narrowing, narrowing down and focusing. I mean, I think middle school is a great time to be experimenting, you know. Um, I feel like, especially with athletics, a lot of students specialize very early on. You know, like club sports starts, you know, when kids are seven or eight years old, old right now, you know. Um, but I feel like in middle school, it's a great time to continue to just try different things, you know, try different sports, try the arts, try, you know. Um, and then by 10th grade, though, you probably want to start narrowing down, right, a little bit, and, and, and being a little more focused you know, whether it's drama or, you know, whatever it is. But seventh and eighth grade, ninth grade, those are great times to be trying different things out. So let me talk about demonstrated interest. Um, so in another survey of, uh, of colleges across the country, over half said that demonstrated interest is either moderately or very important in their admissions decisions. Now I should say not all colleges will consider this. Like I think most of the UCs, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I think most of the UCs don't necessarily look very much and into demonstrated interest. Um, but a lot of private colleges will consider that. Um, and why is this? Well, thanks to the Common App, right, thanks to the internet, it's so easy for students to apply to more colleges. You know, I typed all my college applications out on my typewriter, so I had to have like two or three hard copies in case I messed up. But now you can fill it out online, pop with a common app, you click a button, and you just add like three or four more, um, and, the, and the application automatically copies itself. And so to colleges, they're having a lot of applications, but they don't know who's genuinely interested. How do they know, oh, well, maybe this school is just your safety school, right? So their way of trying to figure out um, who's genuinely interested in their college is by measuring how much that student demonstrates interest. And they actually have software now that tracks that. Um, software that tracks the number of, and the nature of the interactions that the student has with that college uh, before they actually apply. So what are some ways that you guys think um, students might be able to demonstrate interest? What are some different ways? Any ideas? Um, I'm sorry, what? So they visit the campus, right? So if you're gonna visit the campus, definitely sign in your name, right? Sign up, well, you're gonna sign in online, usually for um, a campus visit, but that's one way. What else? <coughs> internships. Um, so internships, I would say if maybe it's for, internships are more like an extracurricular. Um, it may not be so much um, tied into your interest in that particular college, but internships are still a great thing. Any other ways to demonstrate interest? Yeah. Yes, emailing or calling. Okay, now I know a lot of students nowadays, you're doing maybe more Snapchatting, more Instagram, um, although that's great too. Social media, definitely. You can follow, you can like them um, on social media. Uh, make sure you clean up your social media pages if you're gonna do that. Um, but emailing an admissions rep, calling them on the phone, you know, make sure they know who you are. Those are all things. They will count how many times you actually email them, a lot of them, um, a lot of colleges, okay? Um, another great way is the interview. So um, if the college offers interviews, not all colleges do, but if they offer interviews, take advantage of it, you know? If that college comes and does a campus visit at your school, definitely go. Go and sign up, because a lot of times that's the same admissions rep who might read your application. Okay, and if they took the trouble to like fly across the country to come to your school and visit and you didn't take the time to even, you know, to go and listen to their presentation, then that might say something about how interested you really are. Okay, so those are all lots of different ways to, to show your interest. Okay. 
So uh, I just wanted to add to what Rachel said about demonstrated interest, and just go back to what Tim Reilly talked about earlier. So remember he talked about, or I think he did talk about yield rates, Y I E L D yield rates. So yield rate is that if a college gives out 100 offers, how many actually accept, right? Now that number is very important. So remember what he said about monthly yield rate is uh, last year was 37, this year it looks like a little bit higher. Uh, something like that, 45? It's between or, 40 and 45. Right? So uh, <coughs> no university president or chancellor wants a low yield rate. There's a lot of rejection in that number, right? 60% rejection or whatever, who wants that, right? So uh, all the teenagers in this room just want to take somebody out for the prom. How many rejections is, is good? <laughs> so, uh, so how do they manage that? What they're basically saying is, show me that you're interested so that when I make an offer, I know reasonably well that you have a good chance of joining. And it happened to my own son, for example, where he got into higher rent colleges, but some others he did not, because it was very obvious that he would not join them. So nobody wants to waste their yield rates like that, right? So they want to lower acceptance rates because it makes them look exclusive, and they want to increase yield rates. So actually, I recently published a research on this one, which got picked up by several national level magazines. This is, this is a very, very fun topic about uh, acceptance rates and, and university people at the top, they're all, these guys are paid big bucks, chancellors and stuff sometimes paid millions of dollars, and they have management by objectives and other things that we have in our lives, which is corporate <coughs> So, remember you Thank you. All right, letters of recommendation. So, um, letters of recommendation, now that's something that's typically also only required by private colleges. Um, the UCs, at least at this point, do not accept recommendation letters. There is one exception. Um, UC Berkeley will sometimes solicit letters of recommendation, but even then it's just optional, it's not required. Um, but um, but you, would only, um, you would only send it if they actually ask for it. Um, so letters of recommendation um, for a lot of colleges is a significant uh, factor in their admissions process. Um, one thing that I would really recommend is to get to know your 11th grade teachers and your counselor, okay? Um, usually colleges are looking for letters of recommendation from um, teachers who know you fairly well and teachers uh, typically in the 11th, possibly the 12th grade um, in your core academic classes. Okay, um, so for those of you who are juniors, this is a good time to start thinking about who are those two teachers that you might want to approach um, about asking for a letter of recommendation. Counselor recommendation is also very important for a lot of colleges. Um, and now this can be, uh, for a lot of students though, like how well do you know your counselor for those of you who are in high school? You know, you may not know them. Your teachers you see every day, right? Your counselor, you may see them only once a year for scheduling. So for your counselor to write a letter of recommendation for you, a good one, they have to know you, you know? So I really encourage you. I mean, I write about 40 to 50 letters of recommendation a year. Um, and some of the students, I barely know them. They've never come, they've never scheduled an appointment to come and talk to me. So obviously, you know, that letter of recommendation is not gonna be as strong as a student who starting sophomore year or junior year, you know, came to my office, asked for advice about which classes to take or which colleges to apply to, so get to know your counselor, okay? Um, now last, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the application essay, and this could be an entire workshop in itself. This is, this is huge. Uh, but the application essay, I think a lot of students are very intimidated by the thought of writing an essay, right, um, for the colleges. But I want you to think of it as an opportunity, right? Again, you wanna be known by more than just your numbers. You want to be known for you know more than just your SAT score. Um, you want to be able to let the colleges know who you are as a person, and this is a golden opportunity to let them know what's unique about you. You know, give them a window into your world and what makes you tick and what's what you're passionate about. Right? Who you are as a person, um, and I think this is a missed opportunity by a lot of students. Um, if you talk to a lot of admissions representatives, they'll say, for most students, the application essay doesn't necessarily add that much to their application. Most, most essays are not gonna hurt you, but a lot of them are just fairly neutral. They don't necessarily add. 
Um, but if you have a really strong ap um, application essay um, that really just kind of stands out in the mind of the reader, um, that can make a huge difference in the long run um, in, your, in your chances of admission. So that's something um, that you really want to work, you want to work on, I would say starting summer after junior year, um, and really put some time and energy into. Um, one idea to think of is to maybe keep a journal throughout high school, you know, of interesting experiences that happen to you or things that um, are fairly significant that, that kind of shape you, that shape your journey in high school. That's something that you can start even in ninth grade. Um, so that once 12th grade runs, rolls around and, and you have a lot of application essays to write, maybe you have some, some ideas going already. Um, and then the last tip, as far as the essay goes, um, I do encourage students to try to get some help, um, try to get some feedback. Um, a lot of students, uh, even if you're a strong writer, um, you may think, oh, well, this, you know, you may think that you're getting across something across to the reader that may not really be coming through, okay? Um, and so it's good to get multiple eyes on the essay and get some support. And I know that is one service that UC Easy does provide is, uh, is support around those application essays. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a professional, um, but, but you know, definitely try to get some feedback um, around your essay if you can. So that's it. So, uh... So, Rachel, I think uh, we have a few minutes to take a couple of questions and maybe there are better ones. Okay, sure. Do you need the mic back there? I can speak loud. Okay. Just quickly, the question is, did you recall or email the college? That's great. So, what do you, yes. Um, so, keep in mind that, you know, as a student or as a family, you're also shopping for college, right? You're shopping. You have 2,200 different colleges to choose from, okay? 2,200 four-year colleges. And so, um, so this is an opportunity for you as a student, um, and it should be coming from the student, not from the parent. <laughs> they want to hear from students. Um, but you as a student to ask more about their program. Ask more about the, you know, so let's say you're interested in nursing, you know, could you, you, you can email them and say, do you have a direct entry nursing program, or is that something that you have to apply into later? Um, maybe how hard is it to switch majors? It should be a question though that isn't like easily discoverable on their website, right? If you can just find it like that on their website, you know, try to make it a little more interesting or, you know, a, a well thought through question, you know. Um, and if you can try to contact the admissions rep for your area, that's ideal as well. So usually they'll have different admissions reps um, who will read, like say for California or sometimes even as specific Northern California, so try to get to know that admissions rep for your area because they may be the one who actually reads your application. Another question in the back. Yeah, this is about uh, guidance which uh, high school counselors give the students. So based on their knowledge of the students and their grade, they recommend these are the colleges which you are likely to get into and suggest they apply to those colleges. So how seriously should a student take that if the Counselor says, you know, I, I don't think you should apply to Berkeley. Uh, I mean, I think it depends on the individual students, but I just want you to weigh on the counselors. That might right. Be. Okay. So, did you bring you that question? So, basically, you know, how seriously should you take the recommendations of your high school guidance counselor? Um, obviously, I have a little bit of a bias there because, as a as a high school counselor myself, um, I have worked with hundreds of students, and you know, your counselor has experience um, seeing seniors apply to colleges and seeing who gets in where. And so I do think that high school counselors are an excellent resource in terms of knowing from your school um, which types of students tend to get into which colleges. You know? um, so I do think you know, high school counselors can be a great resource. That said, um, a lot of counselors have a large caseload. You know, we have um, in California, there are some counselors who have 800 or 900 students that they work with. So they may not always be able to dedicate as much time to give, you know, individual advice. Um, but I do think they're a good resource too. Okay. 
that's a great, yeah, that's a great question. So when do you talk about your essay? Should you talk about your extracurriculars? Um, one thing you want to avoid is you don't want it to be like a resume in prose, right? You don't want, you don't want your application essay to kind of repeat you know, the, all the activities that you already listed elsewhere um, in your application. It should be something new that isn't somewhere else um, in your application. That said, it can be a great way to elaborate on if there's this particular extracurricular activity that you really love, that you're very passionate about, like absolutely talk about that. Um, but, you know, what you want to avoid is you don't want to use it as a means of kind of listing activities that, that are already listed elsewhere. <coughs> Rachel, thanks very much. Another round of applause for her. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do is, so we are now in the last one third segment of the program today. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to spend the next few minutes just talking about for those of you that need more than self-help, that need help with this college admissions process, we do offer help where people like Rachel and a few others that we will bring on stage, they can actually engage with you and your child to hold your finger and guide you through the process. So we're going to talk about that. You don't have to do it. This, uh, regardless, I hope that you benefited from this program. And there's more to come because Mr. Rainey is still going to come and, uh, and all of that. So let me just spend a few minutes on how we can offer or, or how we can help. So, on our website, you can go to a place called union.uceasy.com. And what we do is that there you would see a list of a bunch of experts, like 25 of them, Rachel being an example. And uh, there is uh, three more. David Campos, can you please stand up and, and just wave yourself? Okay. And then Lena Lee. Okay. And then Natalie Rodriguez. Hey, guys. So, for those of you who signed up for the one-on-one -on -one sessions, you would have a chance to meet with these people later today. So, and we have several more of such counselors. And the way this program works is that uh, for every grade, starting from eighth grade, is when we have a curriculum of sorts, like in a high school or in a school, in terms of the things for college admissions that need to be done. And these counselors would help you with that process. So for example, for the 8th graders here in this room, or 8th to ninth graders, we believe that extracurricular strategy, and to think about that in a right way, is very important because that's a foundation that you cannot lay in 11th grade. So one of my personal regrets with my daughter, for example, is that while she got into every single UC she applied to, she did not get into any top tier private colleges. And the primary reason for that is that, like Tim Reilly said and Rachel said, for extracurricular activities, there were too many of them. They were not taught to, there was no team to those. It's like, some people look at this and say, you are a butterfly, right? All you do is go from flower to flower without any commitment to anything. And that, we believe, is what kept her, even though from a top year private college, even though her, everything else was fine, right? So, but that stuff you cannot change in 11th grade or 12th grade. So we have programs for each grade that we help with. So uh, the way this program works is that you can either call us and we will understand your specific situation. What we do is that we will help you find a counselor. So the way our program works is that it's not like a high school where they say, take the school teacher. So we have all of these great options and we will work with you to figure out who is the right counselor that has the best chance of working with you in terms of the right relationship. So in our selection process of these 25 counselors, we make sure that each one of them is an expert. But what we cannot make sure is whether there will be a right fit between the child and you or between the counselor. It's like at a school, right? Not every child works with every teacher well. So that process is what we will work with you. So you have a full say in counselor selection. Right. So, and then, so if you can just click the next one, please. So, sorry, previous slide. One, one more. Yeah, one more. Thank you. So, the way this works is that the simplest might be just contact us. What we will do is we'll help you with the counselor selection. Speak with the counselor for one hour. 
And that will allow you to understand, hey, this counseling for me, what is counseling, right? And that will you get a sense of what happens. You also figure out, is this counseling going to work for me and my child? And then after that, you can sign up for a bigger engagement with us, which we will help you with. Okay? So the goal today, for those of you who signed up for the one-on-one, -on -one, is essentially to talk to the counselors and figure out who is a counselor. Because I would imagine most of you just haven't worked with a college admissions counselor before. What does it feel like? How do they approach things? Right? So it's not, not so much about how much will it cost. Yes, we can do all of that stuff later. But today, it's just get to meet a counselor, right? <coughs> so that's the goal of those 10 minutes. Vinny, sorry, we still have five more left if somebody wants to sign up. Oh, okay, so thank you, Ruchi. So, so uh, by the way, Ruchi Saran is uh, on our team. She coordinated this event today. Ruchi, great job. Thank you. Uh, so, so what Ruchi is saying is that for those of you who still want to sign up for one-on-ones, they've got five, so you'll have to go to the back and sign up. So maybe after this, let me just finish, but we can then go back. So. So this is, on the screen, is an example of our curriculum, guys. So think of us as a high school or as a school for college admission where we have a bunch of teachers to help you and we follow a standard curriculum for everything. So this is an example of the kind of things that we do in every grade. Okay, please. So, just one, just. So this is the last slide and then we will go on to the next topic. So you will, as you go back, I'm sure you'll come across different college admission counseling companies. I'm not here to say bad things about any of them. Personally, we believe that every one of you should get some help. Doesn't matter whether you're coming to us or not, but I do believe that this process is complicated enough that everyone needs help. So I would urge you to get some help. It doesn't matter whether it's from us or whoever else. Now, in terms of why we are different, so the first one is quality of experts. So you will, for yourself, see our counselors today. An average experience of about 10 years. Rachel, for example, is a graduate herself. She is a child of immigrant parents. So for those of you who are first immigrant family, she can relate to you guys, right? She's been doing college admissions counseling for 17 years. So that's an example, and when you meet people at the back, that's the average kind of experience. We have some counselors that have 30 years experience at PhDs. The second thing is flexible engagement model. What I mean by that is, we have busy lifestyles, especially if we are, a lot of us are dual income. In the Bay Area, you've got to do that kind of a thing, right? So a lot of us don't have time to drive the kids around. It's a pain, right? Uh, so we offer both models. You can work with us on video, like Skype, or in person. We give you that flexibility. The other one is flexible pricing. Remember I said that we want to help everyone. We are not elitist or only for the affluent. So we have packages, if you can afford them, where you can all you can eat packages, where, you don't, where we don't ask questions from them. But we also want to support a family that we have $500 or $1,000. So we would say, tell us how much you can afford and we'll figure out the best way to use that money. Right? And just as an aside, just to remind everyone that we also have a philanthropy initiative where we, for low-income families, unlikely we'll have any in this room here, but for low-income families, we offer completely free counseling to 50 students a year. That's part of our giving back. So flexible pricing is, uh, again, if you don't have too much money, please still talk to us. We'll figure out a way to help you one way or other. Now, the last thing here is that for those of you who are fortunate to be very affluent, money is not an issue. In that case, what we can do is that we can actually create SWAT teams for you, or higher teams, of best-in-class counselors. So imagine one counselor who is just a rock star for UC admissions and we paired that with another one that with Ivy Leagues, another one put that a creative essay writer in the mix for essay. We have created those kind of rock star teams. They obviously are not inexpensive, but for those of you who can't afford that, you can talk to us about that. <laughs> All right, what's the next slide? Okay, so what we're gonna do now is two things. For those of you who have signed up for the one-on-ones, 
So we have four stations. So please look at your steps. It will say A, B, C, or D. So the way this works is David Campos. David Campos. Just walked out a second. Oh, OK. Can he come back in for a second? I'll come. Hey, David, come on. Yes? Yeah, come on. Okay. Uh, so David is David Campos. So he is station A. For those of you, how many here are on station A on your flips? All right. So you also can have time slots. They start at 4, but we're about 20 minutes late. So, so, just, so the ones at 4 o'clock at station A would be with David Campos. OK, then let's go with Lena G. Can you come up, please? And that Lena, all of you on station B are with Lena G. Hey, how are you? Good, good. Hello. Lena? Okay, Natalie, come on. So, Natalie, your three guys at station C. And then Rachel Mann, our co Rachel Mann, she's station B. So, all of you who do paper slips at 4 o'clock, 